Hi everyone, and welcome to Medieval Winter with me, Daisy Victoria. And also we have a visit from Kayla of McNerdy Costumes and Props. I am so excited to share with you this adventure that we had together, playing in the snow and recreating a medieval snowball fight. But wait, there's more, because we're exploring today in this video, two age old concepts. The first of which, you might guess, based on the fact that there's a snowball fight, that has to do with snow. And that, my friends, is keeping warm in the winter. So the question is, how did medieval clothing keep people warm? And we're gonna answer that. Secondly, we're gonna explore a little bit about friendship. Because I had so much fun sharing this experience with my friend Kayla, and as we all know, friendship is magic. And I think that now, more than ever, we could all use some friendship in our life. So since I have a little bit more like data-driven and scientific information on the keeping warm aspect, I'm gonna lead us in with a little bit of the friendship stuff and then kind of transition us into the warmth topic. So friendship is going to be tied into the snow because of these medieval images where we have people throwing snowballs at each other. Now, you usually throw snowballs at your friends, like that's something you do together for fun. So we're gonna start out by exploring this topic of friendship. Throughout time, people have wanted to connect with each other. It's in our nature. It's how we are now. It's how we've always been. We've always heard tales of like friendships long, long ago, blood brothers and, you know, extreme things like that. Let's go to the Middle Ages though. So we are recreating scenes in the snowball fight images from manuscripts in roughly the 14th century, give or take a little bit. My favorite one is 14th century, so we're gonna just kind of center it around there. There are a number of sources from the Middle Ages that relate friendship in one way or another. Some sources see friendship as more of a political or social or transactional kind of thing, much like today, we do form sort of business friendships or you know work friendships or things of that nature they still did back then as well on the other hand there's plenty of fun friendship and just interpersonal interaction in many different ways in a text from 1190 stephen of tournai who was an abbot from paris outlined four things that establish a friendship conversations between two people mutual services an intensive exchange of letters and a reputation of virtue corresponding to reality that kind of sounds a lot like today doesn't it we still like to have conversations and send things to each other exchange letters we may have mutual services whether that's business or for pleasure and of course what is friendship without some sort of virtue that we find in one another another text that i found is from the year 1205 this was written well in rome by writer i gotta read his name bon compano de signa i don't know if i said that right so you might want to check this writer composed anacitia which was basically a text outlining friendship, but it's kind of like types of friends to avoid because there's actually only three positive ones. So it seems like he had kind of a grim outlook on friends or maybe he just wanted to warn people. So there's three positive types, equal, faithful, and real friends. And that's out of 26 total types of friends. So the other 23 are to be wary of. There are things like powerful, vocal, here and there, conditional, imaginary, counterfeit, fair weather, mercenary, predatory, turncoat, camouflage, pleasure seeking, the list goes on. I think we can relate that some of those things still exist today. So I would say it's safe to say people are people and have been people <laughs> as long as we've been people. So friendships existed in the Middle Ages basically like they do today. We might have more of a contractual friendship or we might have more of a friendship where we just enjoy each other's time. I definitely have to tell you that Kayla is the positive type of friend for me. So that equal, faithful, real friend, definitely. In fact, I think that's the perfect type of friend to share my medieval snowball fight dreams 
where I just have always wanted to bring this snowball fight image to life. So it was really cool to share that with Kayla. Let's kind of set up what's going on with the climate and the temperature and why we wanna keep warm. Now, if you've heard much about the Middle Ages, you may have heard about the mini ice age or the little ice age. So the little ice age is generally regarded to have occurred between the 16th to 19th centuries. However, some experts actually place that at 1300 to 1850. So if you look at these charts of global temperatures, you'll see a medieval warm age, which occurs between like the 900s to about 1200. And then it cools off around, you know, 1300, 1400, and it warms up again after the 19th century. Something to think about when you're considering how cold it was back then versus how cold it is now is the location. Even today, it depends where you live, right? So if you live near to the coast, so the ocean will help to keep the temperature kind of regulated. And that is actually due to the high specific heat capacity of water. Specific heat capacity refers essentially to a material's ability to hold its temperature. So if it has a higher specific heat capacity, it will be much more difficult to heat it up or to cool it down. So it'll take longer. And the reason that water helps to regulate temperature is because its specific heat capacity is very high. So if you are near the coast and the ocean, it's going to take a very long time to warm up that body of water versus the land. So it's gonna kind of even out and regulate the climate. Add to that, we have the Gulf Stream, which essentially brings warm water up past the edge of Western Europe and up over to Scandinavia. So if you happen to be near the Gulf Stream, hey, you get extra warm currents. So consider whenever you're looking at source images from the Middle Ages, are you looking at somewhere that's more inland? Are you looking at somewhere coastal? Also other geography, like is it a valley? Is it in the mountains? What's the elevation? What other geography is around? You know, many things can influence what specifically the climate is in that area. But overall, we are looking at a period that is in that little ice age. So we do have to consider that it was pretty cold, especially in the winter. Maybe it wasn't as cold in the summer, but it's winter now, so here we are. So how to keep warm in the winter. So let's go over two concepts, what makes you warm and what makes you cold. The number one thing that makes you cold is actually being wet because that evaporates out your heat. So the way heat transfer works is that heat always transfers from a source of heat away from that source of heat. So the heat itself is transferring, not the cold. So the way that evaporation works in your body is actually the reason why you sweat. So when you sweat, you have that moisture and then that moisture will take the heat with it off of your body. So the same thing happens when you get wet, when you're cold, your body heat is gonna evaporate off of you with that moisture, even if you don't want it to. On the other hand, let's talk about what keeps you warm. The number one thing is activity. So the more you move around and get your blood flowing, the more you're gonna feel warm. The other thing is insulation, because what you wanna do is actually trap your body heat and don't let it escape, right? Because we want the body heat to stay on our bodies and keep us warm. There are a number of insulating materials. It turns out one of the absolute best insulators we have is air. That's right, air. Think about insulation materials for your home. A lot of them have spaces in there that trap air really well. And there's a reason for that because the air insulates. So that means that our best choices for clothing and things to keep us warm are going to help us to stay dry and insulated. And then we're responsible for the activity. And then another note that kind of goes along with this is that we have a personal threshold to cold or warm temperatures that we're just conditioned to. So if we live in a very warm climate, it's gonna be harder for us to adapt to cold. If we live in a very cold climate, it will be harder to adapt to warm and vice versa, 
yada yada. So if you think about people growing up in a cold climate, they're gonna be adapted to it. So it's not gonna be as much of a shock. They're still gonna have human limitations, but they're not gonna be adapted to hot weather. They're gonna be adapted to colder weather if it is colder. Let's get into what some clothing is for cold weather. <laughs> Today we wear, you know, fleece lined leggings, long underwear, multiple socks layers, multiple sweaters, coats with insulation. Keep in mind that insulation is really fluffy. It traps a lot of air. We wear hats, knitted accessories, and it works pretty well generally but can medieval stuff work better? One fiber that you really want for cold and insulation purposes is wool. Wool is a natural fiber containing lanolin, which is a fat. Lanolin is water resistant. So another chemistry thing here is that fats tend to be hydrophobic, which means, I, I mean, I always remember it means afraid of water because of hydro water and phobic afraid but it means they don't like water. So they're gonna be water resistant if you have something that has a lot of fats on it. So wool can actually soak about a third of its weight in water, which is really cool. It won't feel wet until it exceeds that 30% capacity. Another cool thing about wool is that it actually channels the water to the low points. So if you ever try to wash wool and hang it up to dry, you may notice that the upper parts are dry and all the water is at the lower point. And the way that helps us with our clothes is that we're gonna get all that water channeling down to the bottom of our dresses or our coats or whatever we're wearing and it's gonna collect there and our torsos and everything that's more fitted is not gonna feel wet because it's all gonna go to the bottom. Another thing about wool is that it actually warms you up when it's wet. And this is something that I am really interested in because it really, really speaks to my like molecular science interests and passions. So wool is made of cortical cells which are wrapped in cuticles and epicuticles. That creates a filmy sort of skin layer around the cells and that repels moisture. In addition to this, wool is what's known as a hygroscopic insulator. But what's a hygroscopic insulator you ask? Hygro means moisture, so this is something that is going to insulate you from moisture. A hygroscopic insulator absorbs and stores moisture from the environment. So water molecules will actually adhere to its surfaces. And then when the relative humidity shifts, so the humidity is how much moisture is in the air. So when there's different amounts of humidity in the item versus in the air, that change in pressure is going to release the moisture molecules. So if the air is drier, it's gonna want to attain equilibrium. So everything wants to be equal. So the moisture molecules, aka water, is gonna come out and go into the air. Some other fabrics that are period for the medieval times are silk, which is actually also a really good insulator. Linen also wicks moisture, it just isn't insulating like wool. The worst is cotton, which is actually a disaster. When it gets wet, it will definitely make you cold. For me and Kayla, we're using all my medieval clothes so there are wool dresses and some of those wool garments are actually fully lined in linen. And what helps too when something is lined is that then you get more air trapped, right? Cause you've got now space between the outer fabric and the lining fabric. So you can get even more air molecules trapped in that inner space. And that's really good for insulation. We do have a number of linen garments. I tend to make a lot of linen garments because I do live in a warmer climate most of the time. And I like the fact that it wicks without insulating normally. Undergarments in period typically are linen anyway. And that's why you're gonna see that our undergarments are not full length. So we're not picking up all the moisture from the snow in those undergarments. I do go into that cotton range at the end of my last outfit. And I'm gonna explain why that was less of an issue based on the climate that I was in when I wore it. Okay, so let's get to these garments and we'll go through what all the layers are. So first, let's look at kind of a typical outfit that looks a lot like that snowball fight image. The first layer is a linen shift. My shift is actually supportive, so it laces up in the front. 
You can have a supportive shift or just a looser shift. There's evidence for both types. This is linen and it's not full length, so it's not gonna pick up moisture from the snow on the ground. Next, I'm wearing a kirtle. This is actually made of linen, so keep in mind this isn't as warm as it could be, but it still is a nice base layer. In fact, this dress by itself is really good for summer, and I would wear this without the next layer on top for a warmer climate. Next up, I'm putting on a wool dress. I actually really love this dress. The sleeves are just so much fun. All that volume and the rounded dags at the bottom of them, just amazing and so fun to wear. So this dress is made of wool and it is fully lined in linen. So we've got a lot of air insulation going on in this whole outfit overall. My hair is taped using a period hair taping method, which I shared in my last video. I'm wearing a cap on top. This is based on the St. Birgitta cap, and it's just kind of like a basic linen cap that covers your hair. And finally, I have a wool hood. This hood is actually fully lined in another layer of wool, so it's very nice and warm. Next up, we have Kayla's costume. Kayla is also wearing a white linen shift. This one is not supportive, so in this case, the support is gonna come more from the next curl layer. The benefit to having a shift made of linen is that it's very easy to wash linen. You would wanna wash your linen shift quite frequently since it's on your body. Maybe you don't wanna wash your wool gown as often. Next, we're putting a kirtle on Kayla. This kirtle is also made of wool and it is lined in linen. This one has pocket slits in the front because I actually made this as an outer layer, but we're using it as the middle layer here for Kayla, which just goes to show that these dresses are very versatile and they're not like you have to wear a certain one for a certain layer. You can kind of mix them up however it works for your application. So in order to access the pockets, you would wear a pouch on a belt underneath that and then you can reach your hand inside. Since I made this dress with short sleeves, I am pinning on extra sleeves. So these are made of wool and they're also fully lined in wool. So they're nice and warm. That was really common in the middle ages to see dresses with pin on sleeves. So that way you could wear the dress with short sleeves or with long sleeves. I also like how you can change out the sleeves and get another dress with just another pair of sleeves. Pretty cool. Kayla's hair is also taped using some beautiful ribbon, and you can watch me tape her hair into this style in my prior video. Like me, Kayla gets a white linen cap to contain her hair. For Kayla's outer layer, I'm adding this overcoat, which I actually had made based on earlier medieval patterning, so it's not 
technically perfect for this overall period, but because the sleeves are kind of the same as the ones in the snowball fight images, I thought it still conveyed the same overall look. So we're getting away with it here. After all, the patterning didn't really change that much in this time period. We just have all those little details here and there. This coat also has big sleeves kind of like mine. They just don't have dags on them. And she also gets a hood. Actually, I think this one is so fun. It's red wool and it buttons up the front and it's fully lined in a fake fur. So fur, whether real or fake, is going to have a lot of air space in it. So it's gonna trap a lot of air, AKA insulation and warmth. The day that we wore these outfits in the snow for our snowball fight, it was about minus four Fahrenheit, which is around minus 20 Celsius. So that's pretty cold <laughs> and we're gonna see how these hold up. But before we get there, I'm gonna add another outfit. Actually, I'm gonna add two more outfits. Bonus, bonus, bonus. So the next outfit I'm gonna add is one that I filmed at my mom's house later on. We also got snow there and it was also very cold. So it did get down to around similar temperatures to where Kayla and I filmed. So it's essentially the same type of warmth needed as what I just showed you. The first layer here is again a linen shift. It's not supportive and I'm actually cheating and wearing a couple things under it because I wanted to get footage outside in the snow like a crazy person. So don't worry, I'm not freezing to death. Okay, next layer is a linen dress. It's another kirtle style. There are many kirtle styles, all of them very beautiful. This one features a ruffle at the bottom and in fact, you can see a little bit more about this dress in one of my prior videos. It's part of a strawberry dress project I'm currently working on. The next layer for this is another wool gown. This one has buttons instead of lacing, but otherwise is pretty similar to the other styles. Just another variation. This gown is wool and it's fully lined in linen. And also it has pocket slits, so I can wear a pouch underneath and access that through these little openings. With this dress, I am also wearing a white linen cap and I'm wearing a wool hood. I love this wool hood a lot too. It's such a nice, fun red wool and I like the rounded dags at the bottom. See, there's a theme I like, rounded dags. And now for the bonus bonus outfit. This one was filmed a little bit later in a different location where it was not as cold. And that's gonna be really important as I describe the layers I'm wearing. I do have on a linen shift underneath this and then I'm wearing a single dress layer. This is the medieval eyes dress I made last year. And you can see all about how I made that dress in a video on my channel. It was actually based on an allegorical image from a manuscript depicting the Holy Grail quest. And I would say it was a very eye-catching project. <laughs> now this dress is actually made of a linen cotton blend canvas weight material. So naturally it's not gonna be as warm as a pure linen or especially not as warm as a wool dress. And then I'm wearing on my hair a standard linen cap and then also a hood, my cat ear hood, which you can also see in a video on my channel how I made that. And I have a pattern for it. This hood is actually made of cotton flannel and it's fully lined in cotton flannel. So I'm basically here breaking the rules where I'm wearing natural fibers, but not the ones that are best for cold. And it was actually okay in this instance. And that's because it wasn't all that cold. It was in the 20s Fahrenheit that day. So maybe like minus two to minus five Celsius. And I did actually wear a jacket over this on the way to my photo shoot. And then I took it off to do all the pictures and the video shots. So 
So now I'm gonna show you how our medieval snowball fight went. This is the picture that we set out to reproduce. This is like my dream image that I've always wanted to recreate of a medieval snowball fight. So Kayla and I did that. Now notice that in the period depictions, well, in some snowball fight images like these, they are actually wearing hoods and head coverings, but in the one I wanted to recreate, they are not. And I think this makes sense because remember what we said about activity, the more you move around, the warmer you are going to feel. And if you're playing around in the snow and you're doing lots of physical activity, you're surely gonna warm up. I think anyone who's done winter sports, myself included, can tell you that once you get moving, you start like unzipping jackets and taking off those outer layers. So I think it's totally reasonable to assume that they didn't need quite as many layers when they were active because that's how it is now. We in fact found that these dresses kept us nice and warm and cozy in the cold. Because of all the layers of insulating materials that we were wearing and all of those big skirts of wool that trapped any moisture at the bottom of our dresses, we found that it was quite comfortable. In fact, one note that's really different from our modern clothing is that our legs were much warmer. So normally I have to layer up my legs a lot to get them to stay warm when I go outside, but in these big dresses, I mean, look how much fabric is around your legs. It makes sense that you're gonna stay warmer down there. The gloves we're wearing are kind of thin and that's because that's just what we had on hand because neither of us usually reenacts in very cold climates. However, please note that there were much better gloves available for winter climates in the Middle Ages. That was absolutely a thing. Overall, I've gotta say that wearing these medieval clothes in the cold was really comfortable more comfortable than a standard cold weather outfit that I would normally put on. One thing I also love about this style of layering clothing is that you can add layers, you can take off layers, you can change layers, you can swap things out. You can really make your clothes fit many environments and that's really important in a time when we were not living on fast fashion like we are today. So you wouldn't just buy like tons of clothes, you would have a limited wardrobe and you need to be able to swap things out and make the most of the garments you have. And I just think that's really cool. If you, dear friends, are interested in making any of your own medieval clothing, I do have resources to help you make the types of clothing that we're wearing in this video. There are plenty of video resources on my channel as well as PDF patterns and tutorials in my shop. And I do give out additional resources on my Patreon. That said, I must thank my patrons who help me so much to continue creating this wonderful content for all of you guys. And whether you're a patron or not, I thank you so much for being here with me and for sharing this excitement and this love of costuming and ye old times and just having fun with friends. Kayla and I had a really fun time having a medieval snowball fight and I'd like to ask you guys to share with us a fun time that you had with a friend. Let's encourage friendship and the magic of friendship and let us know a fun experience that you had. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you do that. Hit the notification bell and you can find me on all the social medias as Daisy Victoria. Thank you so much for being here. I so appreciate you. And I hope that you enjoy the magic of friendship as well as how ye olden times can teach us something about ourselves even today. I hope you guys have a fantastic, magical day and I will see you again real soon. Bye-bye.